So thank you, so many of you, you for coming. It's really impressive to see such an enormous crowd. We had no idea when we started thinking about this that we'd have this many people show up for a Lester Stevens exhibit in Conway, Massachusetts for our 250th. And I just want to say a couple things before thanking a few people and introducing the speaker. In the last couple of weeks, people have, have asked me a couple of times now, why Lester Stevens? Why are you doing Lester Stevens for the 250th in Conway? Um, and I had to think about it a little bit. Initially, when we started this, and Phil Cantor came up with the idea, and he thought, well, we're, one reason we're doing it is it's going to be kind of easy, because we have some paintings, and the town has some paintings, and that's an easy way to start. And we had no idea how much work it would be. Um, but it's a lot more than that, because the more I think about it, who else has captured Conway, the beauty of Conway, the way Lester Stevens has? Um, the only other person, artist, at least in the 20th century, that comes to mind is Archibald McLeish, who wrote about Conway from his perch top atop Pine Hill, kind of the way Lester painted Conway from Cricket Hill. Um, but it's hard to think of anybody else who really did so many scenes of Conway and Western Mass so beautifully. So that's one reason we thought it made sense for the 250th. And thinking about it some more, I thought Lester says a lot about who we are as Conwayites. He's someone who chose to live here. He spent 10 years looking for a place to live in Conway. He and his wife were living in Springfield, and they searched all over the place till they found Cricket Hill, the, the leaf farm in Cricket Hill. And there's so many people in Conway I know who were like that. They decided they wanted to live here. They chose to live here. It wasn't because of a job or a family connection or whatever. They really wanted to be in this beautiful area. So I think Lester is worth celebrating on the 250th for that reason as well. Um, and like so many people here tonight, it made this exhibition possible, and the 250th, the 250th committee people, and all the other people that, that have helped out. Lester Stevens gave back to the community as well, um, in, in innumerable ways. Um, he helped with the festival uh, a few years before he died. He helped with other exhibits in town. He also would just give away his paintings on a whim to people in Conway. Um, he used his paintings as currency in Conway. He paid his doctor's bills. Someone was reminding me yesterday. He paid his doctor's bills with paintings sometimes. He would give a watercolor after going to the doctor. Um, so he, he was an important part of the community for 25 years. Um, from the time he moved here in 1944 until his death in 69. The, the biggest thing I think he did for the town that has been lasting are the seven paintings that he gave to the grammar school. So all of our children have Lester Stevens art around them while they went through grades K through six, um, which is a pretty special thing. Not many kids have art like that in their library and cafeteria and break room and teacher's office. Um, so we thank him for that as well. Um, and on that note, I just want to say a couple thanks to, to some of the people that have helped us. I'm not going to go through everybody's name because there's a lot of people that went into this ex exhibit. But we have these brochures around, and I encourage you to take a look at one. Um, you're welcome to take one home. If you don't want to keep it, there'll be a box by the door where you can deposit it so other people this weekend will have one. Um, and on the back are all the people that worked on this exhibit and had something to do with it in, in many major ways. So I want to thank all of them. Um, I want to thank the Field Memorial Library for the use of this incredible building. Um, it really is magnificent. Um, I want to thank the Conway Historical Society. Um, by the way, I'm the president of the society, Peter Engelman. I should have introduced myself to begin with. Um, I thank all the society trustees and everybody else who was part of it, part of helping us out from the society. Um, I want to thank the 250th committee for their support and the Greenfield Savings Bank, too, for their support. Um, your generous support for the 250th weekend as well. Uh, this past spring and winter, 15, the 15 artists that are, have paintings in the other room, and there's a sign there about them, um, painted the Lester Stevens home, the, the Lee Farm in Cricket Hill. Um, I hope you all have an opportunity to look at their art. Their art is for sale, um, and there's a binder in there with more information, and there's people that can help you with that, for the pricing if anyone's interested. Um, and a lot of the artists are here tonight, and I just want to read off their names. A lot of them have name tags. Um, some of them may not be here anymore, but a lot of them were here earlier. Uh, Harley Bartlett, if you want to raise your hand if you're here. Um, Michael Graves, David Hatfield, Stapleton Kearns, Ken Knowles, Peter Miller, 
uh, Jim Murphy, you know, still here, TM Nicholas, Eric Minster, uh, Eric Tobin, John Trainer, and Carolyn Walton, who I think is here too. Um, thank you all for being here. And, um, and then thanks to Jim Wenzel for organizing all that. Um, he's been helping us out a lot. He brought these 15 artists together. Um, uh, and now on to our speaker for tonight. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Kevin Murphy. Um, Kevin is the Eugenie Prendergast Senior Curator of American Art at the Williams College Museum of Art. He also teaches courses at Williams on material culture, the art market, and museum studies. Kevin has organized exhibitions and published on a wide range of topics in American art from the 18th century to the present, most recently on the artist Abbott Henderson Thayer. And prior to joining the Williams College Museum of Art, he held curatorial positions at the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas, and the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. He has a BA in Art History from Pitzer College in Claremont, California, an MA in Art History from UMass Amherst, and a PhD also in Art History from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Please welcome Kevin Murphy. exhibit as much as his enormous output of paintings, 
um, Judith Curtis, who wrote the lovely little catalog um, back in 2003, estimated that, that he painted 5,000 paintings. Um, so that would have suggested to me that he would be constantly kind of exhibiting them. Um, an artist that I work on a lot and that Williams College has the, 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 sort of the, the lion's share of, uh, uh, Maurice Prendergast, his career was just a decade and a half shorter than Stevens. Um, and he was prolific, but he managed to paint only approximately 1,200 boilers and watercolors. So even if he had lived as long as Stevens, Prendergast would have needed to create about 3,800 works just to catch up. Um, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an incredible output. Uh, what struck me too about Stevens is that he really seemed to care kind of little about the marketing of his work, um, such that fellow rock court artist uh, uh, Emil Gruppe would take paintings from Stevens and market them back in rock court at his, uh, his gallery. This seemed counterintuitive to me, considering that Stevens had grown up relatively poor. And at the outset of the career, he was very entrepreneurial um, in raising money for first his studies with Parker Perkins, um, and then his, his, uh, his time at the MFA school. Uh, his enormous amount of work and his seeming disinterest in the market really do suggest to me that Stevens felt both compelled to paint um, and loved the process of making images, um, which one can see in the careful way that he composed and executed them. So as I mentioned in my talk today, I'm going to try to put an arbiter around Stevens to show how his life and work correspond to artistic and social trends among his peers, but also point out where he was striking out on his own and seemed disconnected from the art world around him, particularly in the later years of his life. Although I've been told, and that clearly kind of seems to be really true, that it is difficult to date his work, uh, except perhaps by noting that he signed many paintings with the um, with N.A. after 1943, when he was elected as an academician of the prestigious National Academy, um, Stevens included, throughout his career, elements of Impressionism in its particular kind of American strain, but also realism, social realism, regionalism, and modernism. Far from being considered simply an Impressionist, or as a precursor to our modern-day plein air painters, um, whose style has influenced him and, and did amazing paintings in the next room, Stevens should be seen as an artist who was continually evolving, using the landscape around him, particularly here in Conway, as a sort of constant. I know that probably many of you in the audience are familiar with the life of Stevens, and there are maybe some here who, uh, who maybe even encountered him out painting uh, toward the end of his life. So I'm not going to go into uh, great detail about his biography, particularly since the, the Judith Curtis's 2003 catalog uh, for the Rock Art Art Association covers it in, in some depth. However, I would feel remiss about not mentioning it at all um, in deference to people for whom this talk may be an introduction. So I'm weaving, I'll weave his biography through um, the entire time. Uh, I had a painting of, by Parker Perkins. There are not that many, and or at least there are not that many. It's hard to get images of them, but somehow that didn't download. So I'll describe it for you uh, when I get to it. Uh, to take my word for it. Uh, Stevens was born in the picturesque seaside town of Rockport in 1888. At that time, Rockport was known as both a fishing village um, and for its granite quarries. After the turn of the century and continuing to the present. It is also a popular tourist destination, just like its neighbor, Bowser. By all accounts, Stevens was a born artist, demonstrating both a talent and desire to create images from a very early age. When just a teenager, Stevens started taking private lessons with Parker Perkins, one of the first artists to really kind of see the, the continual potential of Rockport Port as a site for painting. Uh, Perkins is not incredibly well known or, or really well documented. He was originally from Lowell, uh, but eventually settled in Rockport. Uh, like many artists who came after him, including Stevens, uh, Perkins painted the boats in the harbor, waves crashing on rocky shores, and the occasional landscape or still life. He was described as self-taught, and his style to me can be considered as impressionist, uh, characterized by the use of thick impasto and the attempt to uh, capture fleeting moments in time, um, either of an atmospheric condition such as a sunset or of the motion of rolling waves. Uh, 
Um, however, Perkins' use of color was somewhat restrained, um, and much of his work borders on, uh, on, on what I would call tonalist, which was a short-lived American art movement inspired by the work of uh, James Abbott McNeil Whistler, who was, like Perkins, originally from Lowell. Uh, some work by Stevens, including some on the Bass Rocks from 1922 and Seascape from 1930, which is on the right, um, depict the ocean and rocks from a low vantage point, uh, which also resembles, and I think was taken, uh, influenced by Perkins' own compositional strategy. The horizon line uh, is placed high up on the surface of the painting in both. Um, the worms I view that Stevens uses places the viewer right in the middle of the turbid waters uh, on the right or of the, the, the interconnected rocks on the left, creating a sense of dynamic movement and immediacy. Um, and, and really, I think, gives the viewer a real connection to the landscape rather than a kind of distance from it, uh, as some Impressionist paintings do. Uh, Stevens' work will, will retain throughout his career a tendency that we see here um, in these paintings from relatively early in his career uh, toward thick application of paint um, achieved either through the use of a heavily loaded brush or by putting paint to canvas directly with a palette knife uh, or similar trowel-like tool. I heard that he was nicknamed uh, Putty, uh, uh, Putty Bill later in life because he was using, uh, uh, he was on like frosting almost. Uh, you see a little of that, although I was I was surprised at that at that you know that, that, um, at how I, I was expecting to see quite a bit more. Um, but anyway, uh, although Stevens would soon have other teachers, there does seem to be kind of a remnant, as I mentioned, of Perkins' work that remained with him to to the end. Shortly after his lessons with Perkins. Stevens was admitted on scholarship to the School of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Uh, when I learned that he studied there during the decade that probably saw the zenith of it as an art as, a, as, a, as an art instructional institution, I was somewhat, I was somewhat puzzled uh, again. Um, Stevens studied with Edmund Tarbell, paintings on the right, uh, Philip Leslie Hale, William McGregor Paxton, who's in the center there. Um, and Frank Benson, who's here on the left. Of these artists, Stevens' work resembles precisely none of them. Um, <laughs> except one could argue maybe Benson uh, to a certain extent. Um, although all of Stevens' teachers are associated with the American Impressionist movement, and Benson and Tarbell were members of, of a group called the Ten American Painters, um, which was kind of the, the group of the Impressionists. Um, the, associ the, the association most um, closely associated with Penn. Penn was the Impressionist. Um, Boston developed, um, I think willfully, um, as Boston is, um, and self-consciously, a distinct style that was very different than the Impressionists um, who lived mainly, uh, who lived in works mainly in New York, um, France, or uh, even the other New England artist colonies. Um, I think of Boston's artists as most often depicting highly refined and genteel subject matter that represents a kind of Anglo-American ideal, um, often tinged with a kind of nostalgic or a narrative content. You can kind of see that particularly in Paxton's or in the of Paxton. Um, the interiors, really to me, Paxton and Tarbell, um, straddle the line between figure and genre painting, um, and the subject of, this, of the painting is really important uh, to them, um, rather than just um, as something that, that is, is something that is in the painting that's a mass that catches light, or that has a kind of that, or that and has something that's about color, the figure, and the, and the subject is really important. Um, there's a narrative usually here. Um, they're not just kind of there for as optical effects, although I guess one could argue that in the Benson there. Uh, stylistically, the Boston School artists tend to create smooth, blended surfaces rather than the vigorous impasto of high-style orthodox impressionism. Uh, although, as I, as, as, I, as, as I said, they're often lumped into the American Impressionist camp by art historians like me, uh, it's mostly because there isn't any other style that kind of fits them better. 
Um, the Boston School artists are very academic in their approach to painting, um, carefully building up the structures of the surfaces of their painting with glazes, um, concentrating on the human form, and carefully delineating space and volume. This was the result of their extensive training in Paris at the famous uh, Academy Julian, and, and most, you know, and of course, Stevens didn't study formal in, in Europe. None of this seems to apply to Stevens' ma manner of vigorously attacking his canvases with paint. What I think that Stevens took away from his training in Boston was a more sophisticated understanding of the properties of light that he could have gotten from Perkins, and an emphasis on draftsmanship, which also seems to underpin his technique throughout his career in works like uh, Church, East Hampton, Mass, or village scene with church over there on the right. And it's not to say that Stevens <laughs> never did a work that gives him away as someone who may have trained in Boston. Still Life with Peonies, featuring a vase of flowers, richly colored fabric, and porcelain objet de art could, if not for Stevens' typically uh, impasto heavy technique, have been painted by Tarbell or Paxton, dating to 1943, the year that he was made a, a kind of mission, full of kind of mission, um, and, but long after he left the MA, MFA school, one wonders whether Stevens had a moment of kind of nostalgia um, for his youth in Boston. Stevens graduated from neither of these universities. <laughs> Make that clear. Uh, Stevens graduated from the MFA school in 1913, a pivotal year for American art. In March of that year, the International Exhibition of Modern Art opened at the 69th Regiment Armory in New York. The Armory Show, as it uh, came to be called, introduced America, uh, most of America, America, to modernist art that had been produced in Europe since the late 19th century. Most notoriously, the exhibition included Cubism and Futurism, which shocked many viewers. There were protests outside, and people were burning works of art, uh, effigies of works of art um, in the streets around the armory in New York City. Uh, Marcel Duchamp's New Descending Staircase, in particular, came in for ridicule as indecipherable. Um, a critic for the New York Times uh, famously called it an explosion in a shingle factory. <laughs> <laughs> on the right is, uh, I, I, and I'll be doing this throughout the talk as a, uh, as, as a plug for WICMA, uh, is a painting in our collection by Morton Schomburg that was in the Armory Show. And Schomburg was, uh, was probably the most advanced of the American artists at that point. Um, I mean, that looks like something that could have been uh, painted by Jelensky or, or, or Matisse. Um, and uh, it's, I think we just got it back from London, so I'm going to be putting it up soon. The Armory Show ended up traveling from New York to Chicago, and then in April of 1913, it opened at the Copley Society in Boston on Newbury Street. Um, that exhibition, that show of the Armory Show, was, was denuded of all the American artists because it was a smaller venue. So they really just had um, the more radical European work. Um, it is unclear, I think, at least to me right now, um, whether Stevens saw the show in its Boston incarnation. Although one might assume that as an art student in, the last, uh, in his last year at the MFA school, uh, he would have been interested in the art being produced across the Atlantic that was being exhibited not too far from the MFA. However, the Boston venue was mainly ignored by people in the city, um, and it was not really written up uh, as much by local critics. The total attendance in Boston was 10 times less than it had been in Chicago, and an even smaller fraction uh, than in uh, New York. Why was it such a non-event in Boston, when it had been met with protests and massive crowds in New York and Chicago? Scholars have speculated, and I, I, I tend to be one of them, that the conservative tastes of Boston, um, as exemplified by the genteel ac academic impressionism of Stevens' teachers, Tarbell, Benson, Paxton, made it such that European modernism didn't actually really challenge Boston art patrons. It was so far removed from them. Uh, it was so foreign to them that it sort of didn't, was on the radar as kind of this challenge. Uh, 
when the show closed in May in Boston, one reporter summed up in the Boston Globe the importance of the show to the city. Quote, without an apparent ripple on the surface of the stream of daily life in Boston, the foes are departing from among us, unwept, unhonored, and unsung. <laughs> the international exhibition of modern what do you columns at Copley Hall is open. <laughs> Whether he saw the Arbor Show or not, Stevens did not immediately demonstrate the influence of modernism really in any of its forms. After graduating from the MFA, he returned to his native Rockport. Rather than choose the kind of sun-kissed and refined subjects of his professors at the MFA, Stevens seemed to go the opposite route, depicting the men and ships that quarried and then transported Rockport's famous granite to far-flung locations, submitting granite quarry at Rockport and the Quarry Dog to the annual jury exhibitions at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia in 1913 and 1914, respectively. Although it's difficult, again, to date Stevens' work securely, these works that he submitted to, to, to PAPA may have resembled paintings like Motif No. 1 in Winter, uh, Curtis has a lot of titles, motif number one. Do, like, I wonder if Stevens liked that title or people were just making up that title. Um, it seems like he'd have motif number one, two, three, four, but it's always motif number one. Um, and which is dated 1913, um, or at the docks, which is uh, on the right. These works show Stevens working in a more realist, to me, than in an impressionist mode. The snow in motif number one is inflected with green and brown, reflecting off the sea and the buildings, which gives the scene an overall kind of gritty, almost dirty tonality, uh, befitting a work, a working dock rather than one used by pleasure boats or by yachts. At the docks is dominated by browns. The foreground is littered with discarded lumber and a small dinghy. Stevens created both paintings by building up the canvas with large, mostly unblended strokes of color, such that in, such that in some areas they become almost abstract, uh, capturing more of the feel of the place than the details of it. The, the emphasis on light as a palpable force within the painting, common to the work of the French Impressionists and Stevens' Boston School instructors, is not really in evidence here either. Stevens is not depicting the temporary effects of light and atmosphere in these works, uh, but it instead is manifesting the docks as substantial enough in their, in their kind of materiality for strong men to move heavy loads of solid rock across them into waiting boats. Stevens' paintings of the docks do not indicate that he was influenced much yet by his MFA training nor by European modernism that he may or may not have encountered. Um, during the Arbor Show's run in Boston. Instead, these works are most reminiscent of paintings by members of the so-called Ashcan School, including George Bellows, who did his own image of hardworking stevedores in uh, the famous painting Men of the Docks. Prior to the Arbor Show, the Ashcan School, led by the artist Robert Henry, and including John Sloan, William Blackens, and George Lukes, along with Bellows, had been the most avant-garde uh, of artists working in the United States. Uh, and they challenged the supremacy of Impressionism in the early decades of the, of the 20th century. Their scenes of working class life, immigrants, tenements, and the seedy underbelly of New York had shocked critics and the art going public alike in the first decade of the 20th century. They were controversial both for exposing a dark side of the American dream and for painting in a decidedly non-academic style but instead spreading thick globs of paint over their canvases, <coughs> similar to, similar to what, what we just saw Stevens doing in the two paintings of Rockport. Although the armory show made the Ashcan artists look decidedly uh, conservative and not at the forefront of modern art, in conservative Boston, Stevens' adoption of a realist stance I think still would have been a kind of radical act that he was departing so much from his, uh, from his teachers. As many artists do, I think he may have left school and began experimenting with styles, trying to find a mode of expression that was really uniquely his own. Um, even as late as 1923, Stevens chose a uh, industrial subject in Forge, which is on the right, 
uh, a painting that not only resembles something that an Ashcat artist might have done, uh, but also seems to have him thinking about the history of American art and the history of American art and the theme of work. Um, especially, I, I, I saw that, that, that Stevens painting and I thought, that's, he's, he's kind of riffing on uh, John Nagel's um, uh, early uh, uh, 19th century Pat Lyon at the Forge uh, from 1826-1827. If Stevens may have known of this painting too, um, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence in this one, by the way. Um, he may have done that too because it, from his submissions to the Pennsylvania Academy, um, as it's one of it's one of the most famous works that was created in uh, in Philadelphia um, at the end of the nineteenth century. I, I, it, it's you know it is the Forge painting, um, so I think he probably was thinking about it. Stevens may well come in contact with members of the Ashcan School when they spent summers in nearby Gloucester. John Sloan spent the summers, and he is over here on the left, uh, spent the summers painting there from 1914 to 1918, um, and William Blackens, who's there on the right, uh, also frequented Gloucester in the years directly after Stevens had returned there. Ironically, their paintings of Cape Ann come closest to impressionism of, of any of their work, uh, as they painted in the bright sun, while Stevens, at least in this period, seemed to have gone in the opposite direction and, and sort of gone closer to the Ashcan School in his own style. By the teens and continuing into the 20s, Cape Ann and Gloucester in particular had become uh, a popular summer, summer tourist, a popular summer tourist destination um, and popular haunts for artists based in New York and New England. Uh, like Sloan and Glackens, many found that the seaside environment with its mixture of working class quarrymen, fishermen, and sailors, who were juxtaposed alongside upscale homes and attractions of the North Shore, inspired them to experiment with new subjects and styles for their art. For Sloan and Glackens, Cape Ann seems to influence them to broaden and brighten their use of color, while they were away from the, the, the sort of grittier and dirtier black, whites, grays, and browns of New York. On his first visit to Gloucester in 1912, Edward Hopper broke free from what I would call the dour Ashcan style he had been working on as a, as a young artist. Uh, in Gloucester Harbor, he emphasized the kind of bright, crystal clear light that he would become known for, while also focusing on the sort of the, the interplay of the sharp geometry of pitched roofs. Stuart Davis, uh, over on the right, and that's a painting that, uh, that I helped acquire from Huntington, uh, so we were my own buyer over right there. Um, also used Cape Ann as a site for experimentation. Um, although he, Davis, had started, started painting in an Ashcan mode, Summers in Gloucester, after a trip to Europe, found him cycling through various post-impressionist styles, um, using, places, using places where land met sea to figure out an individual style, just as Stevens seemed to be doing after graduating from art school. During the 1920s and into the 30s, artists as diverse as Maurice Prendergast, uh, over on the left, and this painting is currently up at Wickham, um, and Marston Hartley, Dogtown painting over on the right, uh, were coming seemingly every inch of Cape Ann in search of subjects. So the question then becomes, how did Stevens react to this influx of artists? Did he at all? Uh, looking at some of the works that seemed to date from the period just before and then just after he served in World War I, his work does seem to exhibit a brighter palette and a more sophisticated sense of composition. Quarry at Rockport on the left, shown in 1924, maintains the low point of view of many of Stevens' earlier Cape Ann paintings. There's just a sliver of horizon and sea and a, and a little spit of land at the very upper edge of the composition to let us know that we are looking at a scene near the ocean otherwise. Otherwise, the painting flirt, flirts to me with almost complete abstraction. Uh, Stephen scatters numerous points of bright paint um, representing the full light of the sun hitting the irregular facets of the quarry. These bring the viewer's attention constantly to the surface of the, of the painting um, and the kind of material composition of it, the actual oil paint that it's really made of. Um, close and patient looking at this, this work, 
reveal that there are recognizable, there are trees and there are little buildings um, kind of hidden within the quarries, nooks and crannies, uh, but these are, are nearly lost in Stevens' I would call almost riotous use of paint. Clearly, by the 1920s, he had developed a love for the material of oil paint and had discovered how to employ it with verb. In Lane's Cove, on the right, Stevens takes a completely different approach uh, to using light. Here, the raking light of what may be the early morning or maybe the late afternoon, uh, hard to tell, um, reveals the solid masses of the rock substrate of the coast. Rather than dissolving form with light as he does in Quarry Rockport, here light defines form for him. The cubic contours of the rocks and reductive forms of the houses in the left middle ground suggest that Stevens may have absorbed lessons uh, from Cezanne and Picasso, although he would always remain uh, grounded solidly in a firm sense of place and never open his compositions completely to the abstract elements that the French modernists did. During the 1920s, Stevens had ample opportunity to observe the work of artists who summered in Rockport, but he also taught at Boston University from 1925 to 1927, and then, from, then Princeton from 1927 to 1929. I think that undoubtedly teaching students uh, invade him to develop a uh, methodological rigor in, uh, that then I think shows up in his own work. <clears throat> In 1929, uh, Stevens quit university teaching to travel in Europe, um, spending some time in France, uh, where he continued to experiment with, uh, with abstraction in works like A Street in France. Um, although it's, this may be an earlier work, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, by the way, 1929 was a really bad year to go on a really extended vacation. Um, and Stevens had to come back after the crash, um, I think because funds were, were more scarce than they had been before. Uh, more, you know, again, a puzzling for me, however, is Judith Curtis's report that, that, that he spent, Steve spent a couple of weeks in France on this trip, but a couple of months in Italy, Italy. Although Italy had inspired American artists in the 19th century, and some people, including uh, uh, Maurice Prendergast, continued to work there, it's unclear what would have drawn him there for so long. I mean, ruins and the kind of neoclassical uh, sort of or classical elements that we think of, um, they don't appear in his work. Um, and they don't appear to you know, kind of be what he's thinking about. Um, Brittany, which he visited just before his trip was cut short by the Depression, um, makes much more sense to me as an analog, probably, to, to his native rock form. American art in the 1920s was somewhat at a crossroads. The prosperity of the decade and the ease of transatlantic travel made Europe seem closer than ever, and American artists could not help but look with a mixture of, of admiration and confusion at the proliferation of avant-garde avant styles, including Cubism, Futurism, Expressionism, and Surrealism. The Armory Show had deeply troubled Americans of all artistic uh, camps from traditionalists like Robert Henry to young artists like Stuart Davis who were looking for new modes of formal expression. The Europeans seem to have gone much further, much faster than their counterparts in the United States. Did this represent some lack of intellect and creativity on the part of American artists? Or was Europe suffering from uh, a kind of degradation um, after a long period of cultural, political, and economic hegemony? On the other hand, America's increasing presence as a power on the world stage, its large geographic area, heterogeneous population, um, and lack of long-standing institutional or governmental patronage of, not, uh, of art also engendered something, again, of a cultural crisis. Was American art and literature simply a debased version of European culture? What was American about American art? To answer these questions, many American artists and writers began to look closely at what they considered to be native and populist traditions, while at the same time they attempted to harness the civilizing power of art to create an enlightened population. As Stevens explained in 1921, quote, no influence is going to count more for more than that of art 
in the reconstruction of refined sensibilities. Realizing this, a movement has been started in New York to take art to the people. Leading artists are pushing it. They propose to take art to community centers where art has been formed. The Great West will be the greatest field, but there are fields nearer home. Cape Ann is one. End quote. To help achieve this populist goal of disseminating art to the people, to, to people, and in the process perhaps discover the true heart of American visual expression, artists form regional societies and associations. In 1921, Stevens was a founding member of the Rockport Art Association, which provided an organized framework for exhibiting and marketing artists' work, as well as a platform for outreach. Although I'm sure that Stevens and his fellow Rockport artists did understand their mission to be one of the democratization of art, we might also see the proliferation of regional art associations as kind of protection. So this is the 1920s. This, it's an interesting thing. Um, they're attempting to create a kind of demand and also a marketing platform for homegrown artists uh, in face of competition from uh, the large urban centers of Boston and New York, not to mention art coming in from, from Paris and London. When preparing this talk and reading about Stevens, one of the things that I was having trouble reconciling uh, was his move to Western Massachusetts. Uh, first to Springfield in 1934, and a decade later settling uh, permanently here in, in Conway. Cape Ann had great infrastructure for artists, both in Rockport and Gloucester, they always had. And even during the Depression, the economic prospects of the area seemed promising, relatively speaking. Uh, except for brief interludes, Rockport had always also been his home. The move seemed to be another contradictory part of Stephen's career, sort of like trying to puzzle out exactly what influence he might have taken from his teachers at the MFA school, Perkins, or from Europe. However, during the 1930s, there were several models for Stevens of artists who moved away from cities uh, to what they hoped would be a more edifying environment in rural America. To some extent, it's the logical extension of Stevens' expressed desire, as I just read in the quote, to spread art throughout communities far and wide. Um, this is Grant, this is uh, Wickma's great Grant Wood. I think it's the, I think it's the best Grant Wood, but uh, Chicago disagrees with me about American Gothic. Uh, both of uh, both those paintings were just in London and Paris, actually. Um, again, a, a pitch for Wickma. Um, as Stevens had anticipated, I think a lot of us associate uh, the phenomenon of kind of moving to uh, rural locations with the regionalism of the West. You know, he said that the, the West would be the greatest field for, for that kind of work. Um, but there were artists on the East Coast, at Edward Hopper comes to mind, who wanted to work their own patch of ground constantly and without interruption. Stevens' stated reason for his move that Cape Ann had become too crowded was undoubtedly true as well. The Depression found America in a, in a self-reliant mood, and there was certainly a thought that real America was located not on the coasts, but in the rural interior. It is perhaps telling of Stephen's own state of mind that he built a studio with a view of Monadnock, a mountain which Ralph Waldo Emerson had lauded as the people's pride of the country's the late 19th century, throughout the 1930s and beyond, New England tried and, and I think successfully staked a valid claim as the true and historical center of American culture. Throughout this talk, I hope that I've given a sense of Stevens' style as somewhat mercurial. Although one can trace influences and parse where he might have picked up this or that technique, which was really fun for me um, while I was putting together this talk, there's something an art historian likes better than trying to you know, figure out influence and uh, and kind of minute, like, oh, that looks like this article. It's great. Game of like matching, kind of match really up. Um, his work, to me, maintained a sense of experimentation and impro uh, improvisation throughout his life. When I looked closely at work done after his move to Western Massachusetts um, and thought about the context of the Depression and the movement by artists to rural locations, I came to see that Stevens' work begins to reveal more information about the landscape, um, but, this is right there, um, uh, which is nice, nice to real uh, Stevens' work begins to reveal more in, in information about the landscape, 
uh, more detail, but at the same time suggests that there's something unknowable, at least visually, about nature. His work seems to reflect the transcendentalist New England of Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Icy Brook uh, on the left and towering trees on the right uh, are again more full of detail than any work we have seen by Stevens thus far. The trees, plants, rocks, and water are arrayed in the foreground uh, for easy visual perusal. And this is true of a lot of works around the room, actually, that, that are from this later period. Um, so I hope that you go and, and circulate kind of look at this and think about whether I'm right or I'm just kind of making stuff up um, right after the end of the talk. Uh, however, our eyes' pro progress through the paintings is thwarted from penetrating really deeply in, into the work. Um, we're caught trying to get upstream, but it's difficult to kind of, there's no clear path, path for us. Um, or we're hung up like a kite, maybe, in the, the tangle of tree branches. And it's so hard to get through to that church. Um, although other paintings like The Brook in Winter uh, don't have the same level of detail, Stevens has rendered the water as, as a dark ribbon, cutting, snaking through the canvas, a body of water that is opaque rather than transparent. Um, and the artist's inky, indistinct background heightens a kind of sense of the mystery of, of nature. Stevens seemed to find more inspiration and variety of subject in the bucolic landscape of Conway and its surrounding communities than he had in the bustling seaports of Cape, Cape Ann. One of the most masterful work, works I encountered in my research for this talk is our apple tree on Cricket Hill, uh, which is his own apple tree, and a tree that is in a couple of, at least one painting in the, in the next room, maybe two. Uh, and in this painting, he also reveals quite a bit about the tree and the surrounding landscape. I mean, you, you get a sense that that tree is an actual kind of character, uh, you know, almost like a, 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 a figure, a person. Um, but he's also indicating or depicting that nature is keeping some secrets from us and from him. The bare, animated branches of the tree and its roots create a dynamic composition. Here, nature is alive, even in the dead of winter, and in an ostensibly simple composition of a single tree in the artist's yard, he has conveyed a sense of the physical and spiritual power of nature, even in a dormant state. Stevens' paintings of Conway in Western Massachusetts are testaments to his formidable skills as an observer and a technician, and are truly transcendental statements about the New England landscape. Thank you. <laughs>